All right, are you ready to crypto? Sweet. This is Crypto Party Albuquerque. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome, everybody. Do not silence your cell phones. Thank you to our hosts. Thank you to everyone who has been working so hard to make this happen in the past week. Thank you all for coming so much. So the tagline for this event is uh, learn how to protect your data from prying eyes, right? So what we're doing here at the Crypto Party, some few digital safety trainings, uh, some privacy workshops, there'll be some educational activities that we've set up uh, across the, the space. We'll get into those in just a minute. But when we say learn how to protect your data from prying eyes, the obvious next question is whose eyes? In other words, who are we protecting our data from? And broadly speaking, there are three main categories of adversaries one might want to protect one's data from. They are, generally speaking, governments, corporations, and malicious individuals. Now, when it comes to governments, I personally like to quote Taylor Swift, who says, Mass surveillance is the elegant oppression, a panopticon without bars. Its cage is small, but out of sight, behind the eyes, on the mind. Swift is talking here about the global and domestic mass spying conducted by the NSA. And okay, maybe this isn't a real Taylor Swift quote, but you get the idea. And even if this is too abstract for you, remember that just this week we learned that the Department of Homeland Security has been monitoring the Black Lives Matter movement since anti-police protests erupted in Ferguson, Missouri last summer. DHS agents are even producing minute-by-minute -minute reports on protesters' movements, even for the most mundane of community events. This shit is real, my friends. Now, with regards to corporate adversaries, we see plenty of examples of abuse and privacy-violating behavior. In November of 2014, for example, Josh Moore, the general manager of Uber New York, was busted for using an internal Uber tool called Godview that shows the company's execs the real-time location of every single customer and driver. Moore was using the tool to track the movements of a journalist without her permission or consent. And just one month before that, in October 2014, two bombshell stories in the New York Times detailed how PR firms representing the oil and gas industry have been openly plotting campaigns of dirty tricks against anti-fracking activists and opponents of the Keystone XL pipeline. And then, of course, there are malicious individuals. A normal Wednesday afternoon, this Colorado man is playing his favorite shooting game, heavily armed SWAT teams battling armed criminals, when suddenly the imaginary world broke into reality, quite literally. I think you're getting swatted. What in the world? The gamer, known as Kutra, was swatted. This is a new kind of prank called swatting. This term stands for a mean prank. Anonymous hackers reporting fake hostage situations and other violent crimes, all just to see SWAT teams rush in on innocent victims. Swatting. I also call this attempted murder by cop. So these are some examples of who you might want to protect your data from and why. And now you might be thinking to yourself, okay, that's great, but um, uh, how exactly? Well, the answer to that is encryption. Now, encryption is just math, but don't worry, you don't have to know any math, not even basic addition, because a bunch of very smart people already worked the math out, and a huge community of free software advocates encoded the mathematical algorithms in computer software programs. All you have to learn is how to use the software, and that's what we'll be doing here during the crypto party. For example, if you want to browse the internet anonymously or bypass online censorship, use Tor, a special web browser that helps keep your physical world location secret while Else you explore the internet. Or perhaps you want to send a private text message. Use an app called Text Secure. Share a file without revealing your location? Onion Share. Chat secretly? Yeah, there's an app for that too. Software called the GNU Privacy Guard, or GPG for short, can secure your email, and you can install browser add-ons like Mailvelope to use it with your existing Gmail account. We'll learn more about all of these tools tonight during the crypto party. But with so many tools to learn, how do we decide what to use? And which one do we use? And when? In what situation? Well, for that, we need a threat model. Now, a threat model is just a way of narrowly thinking about the sorts of protection you want for your data and how to go about actually protecting it. Whenever you begin assessing threats to you or your data, ask yourself some basic questions about your situation, like, you know, what do you want to protect? So we call things you want to protect assets. Assets can be physical, like your laptop or phone, but assets can also be information, like some information inside of an email or knowledge of your home address. Who do you want to protect this data from? Right, so we just talked about adversaries. They are the people or organizations attempting to undermine your security or violate your privacy. And there are a number of other questions involved in assessing threats as well, but the answers to all of these questions are personal and subjective. They'll be different for different people. And we're, we're not here to tell you what to think or how to feel. Obviously, that's your government's job. <laughs> 
So, uh, yes. So what we're going to do here at Crypto Party is introduce a simple framework that you can understand and use to make better informed choices about the technology you use so that you can take steps to protect your privacy, confidentiality, and integrity. Remember, after all, that different people have different assets to protect from different adversaries. Importantly, different adversaries pose different kinds of threats based on what capabilities they have. For example, an individual with a grudge may be able to send you harassing emails, but they don't have access to all of your phone records, so they can't use those against you. Your mobile phone person provider, however, does have all your call logs and therefore has the capability to use that data in harmful ways. Your government has even stronger capabilities. Notice also that the number of adversaries who can pose major threats is much smaller than the number who can pose only mild threats or annoyances. So the power to do the most harm is concentrated in governments and some multinationals with extremely sophisticated capabilities. The more of a threat these capable, these capable adversaries can pose, the more power they have over everyone below them on the pyramid. Right, So it's specifically this hierarchy where the most resourced governments and corporations have more surveillance capability than everyone else. This situation is what's sold to us as, quote, security. Right, And the issue is not that no measure of security can be had from this arrangement. The issue is that whatever so-called security this setup does happen to offer you is a matter of benevolence from everyone above you in the pyramid. Let's take a second look at these. Right, So what are these? Right, What are these things? Anyone? No one? All right, I bet at least half of you are thinking to yourselves, well, those are security cameras, obviously. But these cameras do not themselves provide security. Right? These are surveillance cameras. They collect data about everything they can see. And that data, that video record, only increases your security if the person who controls the video record has your best interests at heart. Otherwise, the data collected by these cameras only help the people controlling the cameras. Right? So think about the huge difference between cameras on cops and cops on camera. So the people who perform the most powerful surveillance in the world are at the top of the pyramid. That would be the USA and the UK, etc. Anyone who chooses to rely on such surveillance for their, quote, security is putting blind trust in everyone who performs more powerful surveillance than they can. And a common fallacy is that with total surveillance comes security. That is, they say that after you give up your privacy, they will give you security. But what we see in reality is that even with that total surveillance, you still have the Westgate shopping mall terrorist attack in Kenya, right? You still have the Boston Marathon bombing, and you still have the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church shooting in downtown Charleston. And it is not stopped, right? Not to mention things like swatting, abusive phone calls from your evil ex, and the constant small harassments that normal people deal with on a daily basis online. And these attacks are not stopped because surveillance itself is not security, right? Surveillance brings the ability to control some people some of the time because when we know we might be under surveillance, our behavior changes. We might decide not to go to a political meeting, perhaps, to censor what we tell friends, family, colleagues, right? We might think that that information might fall into the wrong hands or simply be made public, right? Under surveillance, we might decide not to become a whistleblower. Surveillance erodes our privacy, which is a necessary condition for thinking and expressing ourselves freely. And it still does not stop those attacks or make us safe. The surveillance does not make us safe. So our privacy is violated. Our ability to express ourselves is controlled. Meanwhile, violent attacks on random individuals are rarely stopped. Our security is far from guaranteed. The people who benefit from surveillance are the people behind the video camera, not the people in front of it. And if we can't rely on big, powerful surveillance states with sophisticated technology to have our best interests at heart, and we can't, what can we do to keep ourselves safe and secure? Well, in the digital realm, we can encrypt, right? Because encryption doesn't depend on anybody else's goodwill. It depends purely on math. So at this point, maybe some of you are thinking, yeah, encrypt all the things. And maybe some other people in the audience are sitting here thinking, oh my god, this sounds so hard. And to you folks, I want to say take a deep breath and relax. Remember that perfection is a myth. You don't have to be perfect at this. Remember that all things are difficult before they are easy. Remember that you don't have to encrypt all the things immediately right now, today, this second. There is a lot to learn. So pick one thing, just one thing to start out with based on your personal threat model. Because every little bit does help. The more encrypted data there is out there, the safer everyone who uses encryption is. And even if all you do today, even if all you do is encrypt your apple strudel recipes when you send emails to your mother, you're still helping by making it harder and more expensive for the adversaries of political dissidents, activists, journalists, friends, colleagues, family to target them. So choose a tool you're interested in knowing more about. Go to a breakout session about that tool. And above all else, remember to keep calm and encrypt. Thank you so much for your time and attention.